Oh, I, I, hello, I, I didn't see you there. Well, since you're here, let me show you how I built the uh, Apollo 11 mobile launcher platform. So what's a mobile launcher? Well, it's a fascinating and truly unique piece of structure that was invented by NASA. They assemble rockets on it, then they transport them to the launch pads, where it becomes the support structure for launching. Isn't that cool? I mean, it's like, it's like three machines in one. Um, so let's see if I remember how I built it. I downloaded a 3D model of it along with the Apollo 11 rocket from the uh, official NASA website. It's pretty cool that they share 3D models of their vehicles there, so you can download them for free. I couldn't really use this 3D model for anything because it's not prepared for 3D printing or laser cutting, but it served as a good reference for all the measurements that I needed. So I could uh, take a screenshot of the sides for example, and then use it as a reference for drawing them in vectors like uh, so. As per usual, I designed it in two separate layers. One is used only for engraving, so this design will only get engraved into the material, and the other layer is used for cutting all the way through. Then I sent it to my laser cutter to be cut and engraved. I used the most wonderful machine called Flux Beambox Pro. There's a link in the description if you want to check it out. Uh, my, my model making technique and precision has uh, greatly improved thanks to this machine. I mean, I mean, look at this. There's, there's no way I could cut all this by hand, you know, that would be a nightmare. It's probably possible to cut it by hand, of course, because people were making miniatures before laser cutters. When you, when you look at all the wonderful miniatures made for older movies, you can see anything is possible, you know, and huge props to these guys. Uh, but the difference is that in professional productions they naturally had big budgets and much more people working on them. And here it's just poor little me. And I want to do this as fast as I can because there's the next miniature in line after this one and then there's the next one. So my point is my beloved flux laser cutter helps me a lot. Uh, okay, so I painted all this and now I'm going to assemble it. I decided to spray paint it before assembling because the inside of the tower needed to be grey, but the exterior had to be red, so it would be very hard to do it later when it's assembled, right? The metal cubes you see me use here are called uh, machinist's, the ma machinist's blocks. If you're doing these types of models and you need them to be square, it's a very very useful tool to have, so I would really recommend getting them. Every floor had to be precisely distanced from the other. I use super glue because it's a fast way to work, it sets very quickly obviously and you can move on with your build. And also because it's super. These additional details were 3D printed. I can just 3D model stuff like that quickly and print them and you know glue it wherever it's needed. So it's practical. One other thing that was 3D printed was the crane that lives on top of the mobile launcher. Uh, this could also be doable with a laser cutter, as it's precise enough to cut such tiny designs. The only problem is I haven't yet found a material that's thin like this, right? This is probably half a millimeter thick, and I can't think of anything that's that thin except paper and cardboard. But if I built this out of paper or cardboard it would be too flimsy, so I figured it will be more stable and solid if it's 3D printed. Anyway, I, I primed it white and painted it yellow. Don't you just love yellow paint on cranes? Yellow machinery in general is just wonderful. Uh, there was some kind of a sign here, so I painted it red. Uh, I saw on the photos that these cranes have a gradient from red to yellow, so I sprayed it like that, but I have no idea why it's like that, and how do they even spray such a nice gradient on something so big? So, so if anyone knows, please let me know in the comments. Alright, so now it's time to start working on the crawler slash transporter. The pattern on the base was engraved with the laser and its sides were modeled in 3D along with this magnificent enormous tracks and then 3D printed. Then it was just a matter of gluing all the sides to the base. For this I used a hot glue gun. It's a strong glue but it's messy. But here I could hide the excess glue inside the box so it won't be seen. Machinist blocks are obviously invaluable for tasks like these. Uh, oh, and since they are metal and cold, I often push them into the glue, you know, to cool it faster. So that, that's a nice tip. Uh, by the way, I'm making two of these mobile launchers. I figured, you know, one could perhaps be somewhere in the background while we film the shots, so why not build two? These tracks are so cool. Look, I mean, look how big they are in real life. It's, it's humongous. I. I wish I could live in the crawler. I, I would furnish a cozy apartment inside and I would drive around the world in it and every day would be a brand new adventure. Yeah, so uh, each pair of tracks was glued to one corner and then for good measure I added some more railings and ladders just to make it all a bit more detailed. 
Ah, and now the best part, painting. Primed it in black first to make everything unified. I would usually prime in dark color because if you apply subsequent colors lightly, then the primer will still stay in the corners and act like shadows or ambient occlusion. The only reason I primed that crane in white a while ago is that yellow paint only looks good on white for some reason. I decided to spray the panels on top in lighter gray, but I immediately got bored of masking and proceeded to hand paint it with a flat brush. This yellow part is where the rocket is standing and it actually opens during the launch because of the rocket exhaust. Then a little bit of dry brushing with lighter color to highlight the extruded parts. The brush needs to be almost completely dry for this, so I'm wiping it into the paper towel. This kind of simulates the aging of paint, perhaps it's faded from the sun or something like that. Ah, okay, okay, this is cool. I noticed these crawlers have numbers on them, so I decided to mark my miniature ones as well. I'm just using a piece of marking tape and I'm using the laser on a very, very low setting to cut the numbers in it. Then I precisely glue these stencils into the corners and lightly paint them with white. One of them is number one and the other one is, you guessed it, number two. Oh, this, this is so satisfying. Then I used one of my favorite techniques for rusting things. A piece of dishwashing sponge, the rough part, is dipped in rust-colored paint and lightly pressed wherever we want the rust. A few more details like this highly significant pipes that transport some highly significant substances and it was time to connect the gantry to the crawler transporter. I 3D printed some additional details for the platform, primed and painted them and glued them at the appropriate places. This tiny thing is some kind of a guardhouse, which kind of puts things into perspective, right? This thing is enormous, it's, it's, over a, it's over 100 meters tall, that's about 350 feet. The gantry has a lot of these additional uh, balconies, for the lack of a better word, and these swing arms that hold the rocket. So that was the next thing to do. As always, I 3D modeled them and then 3D printed. It's interesting how everything that NASA uses, from rockets to these mobile platforms, it's not mass-produced, obviously, it's just one of a kind, or, or, or there's only a few of them. And it's consisting of so many different parts that NASA can't build all of it, right? So they outsource it to different companies. So, for example, these swing arms were supposed to be built by some other company at the cost of $11.5 million. But as this whole structure was constantly evolving and uh, plans were being changed, the plans for the swing arms had to be constantly revised too, you know, and stuff had to be rebuilt. And in the end, the original cost of 11.5 million for the swing arms tripled. But the excuse was that that's the price of making the first of something. So, yeah. They say each arm is uh, wide enough for the jeep to drive through. Although, admittedly, that never happened. And you know how I know all this? Well, I read it on the internet so that I could talk about something else apart from how I glue and paint things all the time. I, so I, I hope this was more interesting. Uh, here, this for example, this is, this is called the crew access arm and astronauts enter the rocket through it. That is if you believe any of this actually happened, of course. Uh, speaking of the rocket, I also 3D printed it in two parts. And yes, my hair is getting in my eyes all the time, so I stole my wife's headband. Yeah, I'm sure you noticed. Uh, priming it white this time, as the rocket is mostly white in the end. Uh, it has these black markings painted over it, and there's actually a good reason for that paint scheme. They used white paint to keep the rocket cool as it was waiting for the launch in the hot Florida sun. It would get too hot otherwise. And the black parts were painted in this kind of checkered pattern to help ground cameras to measure how much the rocket rotates around its axis dur during flight. So, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, of course, there are these iconic red markings too. USA letters are probably as big as those numbers that I cut for the crawler, but this United States stencil is absolutely tiny. I wasn't even sure this would work. By, by the way, do you know why they chose red paint for these letters? Well, I have no idea. But my stencil worked. These letters are very, very thin. And then I just lightly missed it with brown dirty color to give it some aging, and the rocket was done. The mobile launcher got the same diluted brown wash treatment. And as a cherry on top, I glued this metal container to the top of the tower. And with that, my build was finished. This build was not easy, I needed to make a lot of custom parts, but it was really fun. 
I took it outside and we spent some romantic time in the sunset. We held our hands as we watched the day gently transform into night. The world around us seemed to fade away, leaving only the two of us and the beauty of that moment. So there you go. If you like this, then uh, subscribe and that kind of crap. And, and let me know in the comments if you think that we actually did go to the moon. Or if you think that this, you know, mobile launcher doesn't actually exist at all. And it's all part of some kind of a scam. And the moon landing was filmed by Steven Spielberg or something. Because that's what I think. See you soon, uh, and bye-bye.